I'm ready to introduce the, the moderator of the first panel of the day, and I'm honored to introduce to all of us uh, Dr. Nancy Sackle. She's uh, one of the 15 leading scientists that have been assigned by the United Nations Secretary General to write the report on the Sustainable Development Goals progress to be submitted in uh, September 2023 in the SDG Summit. And um, I think we will hear a lot of interesting things from this panel, and I'm delighted that you will guide us through the discussion and the interventions. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. We're very pleased to be here. We have another member in the room of the uh, IGS, Oja Persson. And uh, we have been working very hard on the draft, and as you can imagine, the Science Policy Society interface and open science form a very large block of our whole chapter, in fact. And what we talk about in that chapter, I'm just giving you a brief outline to see why we're so interested. Um, we talk about socially robust science and what that means. And we heard this morning about the production of so not only the access to scientific knowledge, but also the production of uh, scientific knowledge and how that feeds into uh, science and then feeds into policy. So what types of so science and what kind types of knowledge actually get into the Science Policy Society interface? And then we described how it's expanding and that open science is an incredibly important part of that. So today I will give you, uh, I've, that's a brief overview of the session in terms of um, a Science Policy Society interface. And I'm going to inform the audience that all the questions will be ad uh, addressed after all the speakers have uh, presented. And the virtual audience, who can probably hear me now, uh, can type their questions for the panelists in the uh, question and answer sidebar, which will be handled by Ariel. And I will introduce each speaker, and each speaker will have 10 to 12 minutes. And then after that 10 to 12 minutes, uh, I will introduce the next speaker, and we will have questions at the very end. So our first speaker is Kelly Gentemann, who is currently an IPA at NASA headquarters, leading NASA's Trans Transform to Open Science mission, or TOPS. At Farallon Institute, she was a senior scientist leading research on open science, cloud computing, remote sensing, physical oceanography, and the science lead for a proposed NASA Earth Venture mission, Butterfly. So for over 20 years, she's worked on every aspect of passive microwave satellite missions, both domestically and internationally, from launch through decommission. She initiated a project to create one of the first cloud-optimized NASA datasets. She was co-chair of the National Academy of Science and Engineering on best practices for a future open code policy for the NASA Space Science, a co-chair of the NASA Standing Committee. Very, very distinguished, and I, I turn it over. <laughs> I turn it over to you. Hello, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, my name is Shell Gunneman, and I am the science lead for NASA's Transform to Open Science. It's a five-year, $40 million initiative that kicks off with a year of open science. And you can look up there at the names of all of the wonderful people. We sit within the Open Source Science Initiative in the Chief Science Data Office, affecting science across all of NASA. And these are the people, the large group of people working to advance open science across NASA and science. So, NASA has big plans for 2023, plans to change the culture of science, and we're pushing the boundaries of what is possible and expanding who can participate. Carl Sagan, an astronomer and astrophysicist and part of NASA since its inception, has said it's the responsibility of scientists to never suppress knowledge, no matter how to acknowledge that that knowledge is it's the, to never suppress knowledge, no matter how awkward that knowledge is, no matter how it may bother those in power, we're not smart enough to decide which pieces of knowledge are permissible and which are not. And I think that quote really gets to the core of why open science is so incredibly powerful, because it's connected to power. Knowledge is power, and when we share power, we bring up everyone and we all win. And that is why NASA is all in on advancing equitable open science. 
So I am an advocate for open science because when I look at the challenges ahead, especially as a climate scientist, I know that we need faster, better solutions. We need open science. So in April of 2022, I joined NASA to lead TOPS, the Transform to Open Science mission. And I now had a full-time job to advocate for open science, which I think is many people's dream. It was, and so one of my immediate goals upon joining NASA was to try and see if we could look at getting other agencies involved. Now, agency partnerships take years and involve a lot of lawyers. Uh, that wasn't a path I was interested in pursuing. Uh, and so NASA was able to appoint me to the OSTP Subcommittee on Open Science, which is a group that has been working for many years to advance open science at different agencies. And this is a group of federal civil servants who are passionate about open science and have been working to advance open science. And they had already been talking about a year of open science. So when I came in and I had time to actually work on this, it was a, really a, a, a mesh of minds and a dream come true. So we were able to work together and form the subcommittee on a year of open science with 10 other agencies. So now we've announced a year of open science. And if you look at these agencies, it's everything from astrophysics and studying the sun to studying climate and cancer and COVID, to studying geology and the humanities and bringing the humanities and science together. There's almost $90 billion in federal research funding represented by these agencies that have now signed on to a year of open science. And so to change everything, we need everyone. We have part of the piece of pie here, but we need everyone in the globe to join in open science and really try to move policy and science forward together. We know that language matters. So one of the first things that the sub working group on the year of open science did was sort of merge many of the existing open science definitions. As open science is merging into the mainstream of science and its transformative ability to dissolve barriers and roadblocks to participation is being enhanced, these 10 federal agencies sort of looked at these definitions and came up with one that sort of recognizes that open science isn't a product, it's really a practice. And so open science is the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security, privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. This is now the definition that all 10 agencies will be using to promote and for open science. We also agreed on four goals. Given that these are federal agencies, these are goals that we anticipate starting to address during the year, a year of open science. And that we will be coordinating with each other and during 2003, 2023 begin working how to set out how we will accomplish each goal, which will certainly take longer than one year, but it's important to start somewhere. So goal one, first, to carefully begin developing plans to advance open science. The group is developing example guidance on what this could include using the excellent National Academies Toolkit and also the excellent UNESCO recommendations on open science, which really set out a comprehensive framework for a plan like this. So, and also working with plans that have been implemented by other countries, organizations, and universities. And this is written a little bit vaguely because this is something that could be adopted at a country level, at a university level, or within a research group. Goal two reviews is designed to create a more equitable and open scientific future, again, tailored for each agency and the type of reviews it does. We want to believe that science is a level playing field, but science depends on reviews, and we know that those reviews perhaps aren't as fair as they should be. So for funding agencies, this could include looking at proposal panel reviews that determine who is funded. For other agencies, it could include reviewing the diversity of committees or boards that conduct project reviews and determine what is selected. And this goal asks where possible without violating security concerns to collect and open up anonymized data about review outcomes that include where possible information that can be disaggregated by gender, race, career stage, and accessible to, make, to be, better assess how decisions are being made. 
Goal three is including open science and evaluations and incentives is designed to shift the metrics by which success is measured by addressing the lack of career incentives that currently recognize open science activities. Evaluations could include awards, practices, career performance plans, hiring practices, and more. For funding agencies, evaluations could include proposal funding evaluations and asking about open science activities. Many studies show that open science activities such as sharing data and citable data and software increase citations, which is the primary metric used within research to assess an individual's merit. We would like to, to provide a more immediate and definite incentives to scientists and individuals who want to adopt open science practices by including these activities in evaluations that are ongoing now. Goal four, to include diverse voices, is designed to efficiently remove actual barriers to participation and safeguard against creating new barriers in science by engaging with historically excluded communities through the planning process. As we move towards more openness, there are potentially side effects that could disproportionately impact marginalized communities. And this could, th so this could ensure that working groups or committees developing these open science plans have diverse representation and that conferences, meetings, hackathons are as open as possible to provide opportunities for participation by marginalized communities. NASA's open source science initiative is supporting many of these areas. We are working to create infrastructure. We're working to advance policy. We're working on funding, for, for example, open source software tools and libraries, funding open science. And then a big part of it is community. We recognize that we can't do this without bringing the community along. And that is the Transform to Open Science mission. And this, we hope, will act to catalyze the adoption of open science across NASA. And to show our commitment, NASA has committed $40 million in a five-year mission for TOPS. TOPS has three strategic goals, to support 20,000 researchers to earn a digital open science certification, to double the participation by historically excluded groups across NASA science, and to enable five major scientific discoveries through open science principles. We know that we need a more equitable scientific future where more people are able to participate in science and more people just aren't in the room but they have a seat at the table because only then will we find the best solutions. During the 2023 year of open science, we'll be holding workshops, publishing articles, designing incentives, and coordinating activities across NASA and other agencies. Please get your phones out and scan this QR code. This will help you sign up to earn a NASA Open Science Digital Certification by completing a NASA Open Science Curriculum, which is a community-developed introduction to open science with inclusivity, accessibility, and diversity at the forefront. Earning this Open Science Certificate indicates that researchers have key open science skills, that scientists will need to acquire these new skills to participate in open science effectively especially when applying for NASA funding opportunities or other funding opportunities. NASA's building this curriculum, holding workshops, in-person, virtual summer schools, and other events to both support the communities and allow for more diverse participation. Please join us and enroll so we can all learn how to do science better together. And if you missed the QR code, here it is again. <laughs> you could just give us our email. And what will happen is we'll let you know when the workshops are being held and when free and open online courses are available. And I'm going to end with an inspirational quote, which is something incredible, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. And I think we know that we're going to get there faster with open science. And that's why NASA is putting its visibility and its backing behind open science. And lastly, I just have to thank the many, many global community of open science experts, some of whom are pictured here, who have shared their knowledge and experience with us because we, of course, did not invent this. We are building on the shoulders of giants who've been working in this area for over 20 years. So thank you. Thank you so much, Shell. That was incredibly impressive. I, I think it's uh, very um, in reassuring or, or wonderful to know that a federal public agency, so with public funds, is taking um, um, 
five steps, was it? Or they're, 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 you're accelerating that goal, which is really highly encouraging, especially from a Canadian who works for a public agency. <laughs> <laughs> I now move on to our second speaker. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Al Aldo Strobel is the Acting Group Executive Strategy, uh, Planning and Partnerships, and Executive Director Strat Strategic Partnerships. He serves as South Africa's national contact, uh, national contact point for the European Research Council, as board member of the Water Research Commission, as the co-chairperson of the Executive Support Group of the Global Research Council, and as council, uh, as council member of ISA, he is foreign fellow of the Ugandan National Academy of Science, a senior fellow of the Pan-African Scientific Council, and a founding member of SEAS. I am sitting among giants, <laughs> so I will uh, uh, finish by saying he is currently leading and directing significant in initiatives, including the African Open Science uh, Platform, the recent award of the Future Earth Global Africa Hub to the NRF, and the Science Granting Council's initiative in the Sub-Saharan Africa. He has established extensive international professional networks which span the globe higher, for higher education, research, policy, and funding spheres. Uh, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, thank you very much. And colleagues, really a great pleasure and privilege uh, to be here. I am among giants. It's certainly not the other way around, Nancy. So yes, I work for South Africa's National Research Foundation. It's the public funding agency like all your countries have. But I am also representing Dr. Phil Mjwara today, who is the Director General for the Department of Science and Innovation, Line Ministry of the National Research Foundation. And he has spoken before, and he will speak formally on Friday, but really our honor to uh, also acknowledge Dr. Tiamu Mutehwa, who is the Director of the African Open Science Platform, uh, hosted by the National Research Foundation. Our parameters for discussion during this event and through other numerous global events are very clear. Our society is rapidly advancing towards a state of increased global digital interconnectedness that is characterized by exponentially increasing data generation sharing and analysis across broad segments of society beyond the research endeavor. Secondly, as a driver for the democratization of knowledge, the establishment of open science systems contextualized by this technological change and increased internet accessibility by the population is an intervention directly linked to improving the well-being of the world and of the African continent. And I'll be focusing many of the remarks today on the African continent. And then thirdly, I'll focus on SDGs as a parameter or framework within which to achieve open science or enabled by open science as the third one. As Shamila and Anna has said, we are fresh from the UNESCO Open Science Day that was co-hosted by UNESCO, the NRF and Department of Science Innovation during the World Science Forum in December in South Africa. This really creates a framework for our engagement and to determine what is our opportunity framework within which to attain open science. Informed, therefore, by these recommendations, and this was the brief to speak, is the progress of South Africa's own open science policy in the country, led by various departments, the National Research Foundation, the Academy of Sciences, and Universities South Africa. The draft was published in February last year, currently open for consultation before this now is formally approved. And as our DG has spoken about this during the December session, we have been very clear what the pillars or objectives of this open strategy for a country is. Firstly, there's a very strong and clear focus on education and skills development. This is a critical enabler for us as open science is not significantly supported yet by incentives or evaluation practices. Secondly, we're very focused on the infrastructure of open science and what that implies and how to enable the infrastructure. For instance, 
in an upper middle income country like South Africa, connectivity remains a critical factor in ensuring the accessibility and exploitation of the open science infrastructure. Thirdly, citizen science. We must embed open science in society, encouraging a scientists and society to come, become more responsive to societal and economic expectations by fostering a stronger relationship between science and society. And if I may divert a bit, this has become in a very strong focus of all science granting councils in the world, is that formality or embeddedness of what it means to enable citizen science within research funded and within which research is evaluated. Fourthly, the sustainability aspect. And fifthly, as a cross-cutter, the very strong framework that partnerships brings to enable these policies. This open science policy of South Africa, of course, is framed within our new science technology and innovation white paper, the decadal plan to implement this white paper, the NRF's own open science strategy focused on research and granting. So technically, colleagues, we have a new slate to start with, if you will, because our policy environment for STI is relatively renewed. And with that then, the open science strategy for South Africa. The next focus is to contextualize perhaps a few major initiatives on the African continent that has really been driven and supported by a host of organizations, but also this idea of solidarity, of forward-lookingness, of consolidation of effort within the continent. And of, one, of course, one very prominent one is the African Open Science Platform with numerous partners. And I'm very happy to see that Dr. Matthew Dennis of the International Science Council uh, is participating in this conference, who's been a major supporter of this with CoData, with our own Department of Science and Innovation. And although the intention is very forward-looking, of course, as it should be, there's numerous engagement that has already shown this cohesiveness within the continent, and certainly the partnership component that is linked to that. Secondly, from a Southern Africa perspective, a number of countries using their national research and education networks or NRENs are currently working together under the UbuntuNet Alliance, and that will formalize an agreement with the African Open Science Platform that really advances a new way of engagement for Southern Africa. And this focuses also very strongly on the, on the uh, redesign and the digitalization of universities and colleges within this region. Thirdly, a very inclusive and strategic initiative to include French-speaking West Africa within the open science debate has been launched in 2019 already and has gained momentum in 2022 with the Open Science in the South conference for the far majority supported by the major French research institutions led by CNRS with their new Africa strategy. A fourth dimension is that of funders. And I did indicate at the beginning, I have the luxury of speaking as a policymaker by virtue of the DSI, but then certainly as a funder, which is the major focus. Within the context of the Global Research Council, which is an organization of more than 70 national public funding agencies with a combined funding envelope in excess of $70 billion. Also within the context of the Science Granting Councils Initiative, which is a multi-year, multi-country capacity development initiative of public funders on the continent. And we're standing now at 17 countries within the SGCI. The combination and very strong network that these players provide brings us to the level of how we can reach consensus. We can consolidate efforts, at least from a funder's perspective, that will then have the intent to have that major influence that we are looking for from the funder's perspective in the debate of open science. And it is multidimensional, as you can imagine. So from public consensus reports on public engagement, for instance, 
or reviews and evaluation or access to infrastructure or ethics in research evaluation. All of those is reaching a stage of formality that you will, if you will, that is really starting to influence this debate. And the final perspective from this environment is the role of universities. I feel sometimes that we don't engage them enough or that the voice is not strong enough. That is where the far majority of research takes place in Africa and in many northern countries as well. And it is more than just a seat at the, about more it is about more than just a seat at the table. It is about the voice, the engagement and the implementation mechanisms if you will within that sector. I am not sure if you are aware of the real seminal study that has been conducted last year that is looking at what policymakers should consider in Africa uh, in the context of open science. They have analyzed more than 1,000 mandates and policies that are currently formalized, of which 36 are from Africa, 240 are from the Americas, 84 from Asia, 709 from Europe, and 42 from Oceania. This is probably the most inclusive study that focuses on the policy maker when it comes to open science. And one of the main findings is that open science environments should be seen as more than technical problems and infrastructure developments. They should all be also be seen as tools and mechanisms to solve broader societal problems. And I think that is the basis of our discussions, colleagues, during this third uh, meeting of the UN Open Science Conference series. As I conclude, perhaps a few key messages in the policy environment. So the far majority of you in this room and online are directly or indirectly involved in policy making. And where else than be at the United Nations when one speaks of policy making. But I'm sure also we have the experience that it is very easy to make a policy. It is perhaps more challenging to implement those policies effectively. And uh, from a South African perspective, that has certainly been the case. So when one speaks then of what is our revised or transformed approach to really embedding the construct of open science within our countries. There's a number of considerations. I think one of those is that policymakers should consider the readiness for the open science policy, which should include other dimensions like awareness, practices, and the perceived benefits. Also, that policymakers are reminded that the field of open science is by no means complete and that there will always be new areas and new issues to consider. And I think Anna mentioned that in the previous panel's discussion. We have to strengthen existing frameworks, technical considerations, and responses to these policies, and it must go hand in hand with ethical, legal, and social considerations. And something that compounds the uh, lethargy of implementation even further is differentiation of implementation even within individual countries that has their own numerous policy frameworks, institutional players, etc. So we speak at a meta level or at a regional level to try and implement or align or strengthen open science policies. But there's a very strong basis and argument that this must start at the local level and it must roll up in a way to that higher level. We're very pleased about the leadership of global organizations like the UN, like the OECD, like UNESCO. But certainly from a country perspective, colleagues, the work starts there and our adherence and readiness for these policies must certainly be uh, strengthened. As a final comment, um, there is much in the media of the nature groups, excess, gold, low and middle income countries. You've seen the challenges and criticisms of inadvertently or maybe directly 
advancing climate change researchers in the private sector through the review process, etc. But I think at some stage our discussion must advance beyond always funding or paying for access. It feels like that is overtaking the basis of our positioning currently. My take is we in an existential challenge of the private sector's interest within a capitalist system, which is accepted, that is the world order of economics. But it is also very important that we have a different perspective, and that is our shared and common challenges of doing something that is right for the greater good and for impact. So perhaps that is our largest challenge beyond the economic discussion of this process and the role of private sector, but really to start equalizing the playing field and not always find or trying to find resources for low and middle income countries. And if and when we have not equalized that process, we will be continuing the debates that we are having. Thank you very much again for UNESCO's enormous support in the process, not only of the African Open Science Platform, but really engaging through, for instance, the first toolkit of its kind to bring an understanding to open science below the policy level, because our success will be below the policy level, but guided at that strategic level. Thank you indeed. Thank you so much for a fascinating talk. It's, uh, uh, we can also see that uh, open science is accelerating across Africa and that you're also make those networks are making, are forming, are connecting to other networks. Uh, and it, for, as your example was the African open science platform, it just grows and grows. I was particularly interested in the part where you talked about how you're connecting that to policymakers in open science. I'm hoping that we can uh, hear more about that in the, in the, um, in the question section. But for now, I will move on to our last speaker. And here we're going to uh, experiment <laughs> with the hybrid session. So I would like to introduce Padmanaban Balaram. He is on the faculty of the Molecular uh, Biophysics Unit, the Indian Institute of Bangla Bangalore, India, for most of his scientific uh, career from 1973 to 2014. He is currently a chair professor at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. He was educated at Ferguson College, uh, at the Indian Institute of Technology, at the Carnegie Mellon University of Pittsburgh, and after a, po a postdoctoral year at Harvard, he returned to Bangalore, Bangalore, where he is now. And I hand the floor to you, Dr. Balaram. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shekhar, for introducing me. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this panel. Uh, you know, I must say I am a university scientist. I'm an academic scientist and I've been one for nearly 50 years. And therefore, I have seen how the culture of science, uh, the culture of science publishing, uh, the field of journals, all of these have changed over the last half a century. In addition to being a laboratory scientist, I was also the editor of India's uh, interdisciplinary journal, Current Science, for nearly 18 years. And therefore, I had a ringside view of the way in which science publishing transformed in the period of the 1990s and the early part of the 21st century. I must emphasize that I speak in my capacity as a scientist who's worked in India for a long time. Like most countries, the Indian academic community strongly supports open science, which to most of us means access to the published literature and data of science at reasonable cost to the public extent. This also implies that if these funds come from public sources, that journals and databases will be freely available to all individual researchers. Now, of course, this is not true in today's world. Much of science, 
has become inaccessible to people in many parts of the world. There are two things that scientists do. They collect data and they write papers. And so I am going to make two points. The first is a piece of information. Second will state a problem. First, let me give you some news from India. The Indian government has set up an Indian biological data center under the Department of Biotechnology. This is very important considering how important data was during the COVID-19 pandemic. This center is expected to serve as a publicly accessible database for biological data collected under publicly funded research projects. A beginning has been made with the SARS-CoV-2 genome data that has been generated, and it is anticipated the genomic and structural data from diverse organisms will become available. This data center will collaborate with the well-established databases at the European Bioinformatics Center and the National Center for Biotechnology Information in the United States. However, once these data centers are set up, there will arise several very difficult policy issues on the sharing of sensitive data. And those need to be addressed both legally uh, and also in international fora over the next few years. And here I talk only about biological data. Many of you are interested in climate science, so you would be interested in climate data. It turns out that a great deal of data that is generated in laboratories around the world turns out now to be data which cannot be shared in its entirety for various reasons. It is those reasons which prevent complete open data sharing, which needs to be understood and addressed. The second point that I would like to make is to really state a problem that is undoubtedly going to be discussed in other panels. Everyone agrees that research journals must be freely accessible. However, the open access movement, which advocated public repositories of manuscripts, has been overrun by commercial publishers who have launched open access journals, which requires authors to pay for publishing. Increasingly, academic publishing has moved from a reader pays model to an author pays model. In both these models, the underdeveloped countries of the world are at a serious disadvantage. Open access initiatives in the advanced countries, which provide large research grants that accommodate publishing charges, and also institutional arrangements with publishers, have distorted the scenario of science publishing. In a conference on open science conducted by the United Nations, we cannot avoid any mention of the elephant in the room. The real elephant in the room is that unreas are commercial publishers. Unreasonable profits have been made by commercial publishers, even in times of economic depression. If you look at global statistics of profits of publishing houses, they have remained constant over the entire period from the depression of 2008 all the way till now. They're not affected by pandemics. They're not affected by anything. These unreasonable profits are really because the publishing industry is placed on a special pedestal. A consequence of the fact that much of the publication process is handled by unpaid peers in the academic community. Scientists and publishers have been in a relationship for a very long time. This began in the 1950s. And I might remind you, we heard a very inspiring quote from Carl Sagan. I will now give you a quote which is not quite so inspiring. This is from Robert Maxwell, arguably the creator of the modern science publishing industry. He once said that science publishing is a perpetual financing machine. It is this problem that needs to be addressed. There are some parallels with the pharmaceutical industry. The poor countries of the world 
struggle with the rising costs of pharmaceuticals. At the same time, pharmaceutical industries make enormous profits. And so there is always the question of what is reasonable profit, even in what I have just heard is the capitalist world order. Even in that, one must ask what is reason. Ironically today, much of publicly funded research the world over sits behind impossibly high paywalls on the internet. In most countries, access to information is often through sites like SciHub, which have been labeled as access to lots of people in the world who do not have access to the literature of science. There are, even as I speak, legal efforts to block even this access are ongoing in India, where Elsevier, Wiley, and the American Chemical Society seek to block access by court injunctions. The power of uh, money cannot be disputed, and it turns out that there might always be legal avenues by which even this access can be blocked. Hundreds of thousands of students all over the world will then be denied access to literature which is currently available. One might ask at this point, are there policy initiatives that might be considered? I really do not know because I have not been tremendously involved in policy in this area. But one will be to re-examine national copyright laws or create an international framework under UNESCO which is equitable and provides poorer countries full access. It is ironic that some of the original scientific literature of the 19th and 20th centuries sits behind paywalls. The new digital technologies have provided a means for publishers to profit even from past work published by organizations that no longer exist. Remember that we've moved very far away. When I began my career in science, most journals were produced by not-for-profit scientific societies. Today, most journals are produced by for-profit commercial publishers. A second approach might be to support international repositories which can expand to provide some of the value addition that the journals bring to individual scientific papers. I do not deny that journals bring a certain value in aggregating papers and presenting them appropriately. This could in principle be also done by international open access repositories with all the technologies which have currently become available. Lastly, a concerted international effort is needed to reduce the price of information derived from publicly funded research. If the deteriorating culture of science is not addressed globally, open science and the benefits derived from it will remain a mirage and meeting sustainable development goals will be a formidable challenge. I have no solutions to offer here. I have posed some questions and I've really told you what is uppermost in my mind, which is actually access to scientific information as a practicing. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say my piece. Thank you. Oops, thank you very much, Dr. Balaram. Uh, what is on your mind is on many people's mind, and it's, uh, it's great that you have raised, uh, or the elephant with it, uh, that you speak about is a very large elephant, and uh, I'm sure it can generate a lot of discussion. So I'm now going to open the floor to any questions for our speakers, and we have one question over here, so I'll... I, you have a mic. There you go. Thank you so much, Cher. And my question is to Dr. Shell. Uh, I'm Irina Kuchma from IFO Open Access Program. 
it's really amazing uh, this campaign around the year of open science. And my question is, uh, what piece of advice would you give to others who are planning similar campaign, for example, open climate campaign or any other campaign around open science based on your learning and experience? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would say that uh, almost everything that I have been doing since April and a little bit before that has been based on the National Academies Toolkit and the UNESCO recommendations on open science. If you look at uh, the goals for the Transform to Open Science project, as well as the federal initiative, you'll find the seeds of those reports th woven throughout there, or the threads of those reports woven throughout there. And I think that it's really important that we try to build together and align efforts wherever we can. Uh, there's very little that any individual can do, but I think I'm a really good example of that when you can align efforts with larger organizations and agencies, you can actually really start to transform things. I think that there is a global momentum right now that many of us who are advocates for open science can really help try to steer conversations and really emphasize, I, I think part of the power and why this is resonating with so many agencies and organizations on a global level is that the sort of, I think there's like been a key transformation in how we've thought about open science, where it, as the last uh, invited author just spoke about is, it's not so much a technical process. It really is a practice. And when we think about it as a practice, we start to also recognize how it broadens participation in science. And that's incredibly important given the challenges that we're facing, is that the ability for more people to participate in science. So I, I guess I just say like, we're all standing on the soldiers of giants and they have these wonderful open access publications that are essentially guidebooks for all of us to work together. Thank you very much, Shell. I can uh, open the floor again to any more questions. Oops, we've got two here. Um, I did not see which one was faster. <laughs> so, well, defer, okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Claire Redhead. I'm Executive Director of OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association. And this is a question, I think, for Dr. Strobel, but others may want to comment. Um, we've heard a, the, the second elephant, and I think in all of this, there's, there's a herd of elephants, so I'm sure there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be other big elephants that come up. But um, Dr. Bannerman has obviously spoken um, about problems of global access, and your uh, comment was that we need to go beyond paying for access. Um, I totally agree. Um, I've been working in, in uh, open access for, for a decade, but less than many of the others in this room. And so much focus has gone on access, but we're now facing a problem of participation. Um, the biggest number of journals actually are led by scholars. Um, there's a lot of work being done to support other models, um, PLOS being, uh, being one of those, but also there's a, there's a big project in Europe which is looking into supporting Diamond. Um, but prestige, the issue of prestige, um, affects small journals as well as it does affect open access publishing emergents who are also trying to provide innovative solutions. And uh, OASPA is working towards a, a diverse landscape for open access publishing, but also an equitable future. Um, so I wondered how you see that policy can help focus on reforming research assessment more broadly um, with organizations like UNESCO and how much focus of policy is going in that area because I think that does underpin both the publishing uh, ability to be able to support researchers but also the, um, the choices that researchers are able to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I said earlier no difficult questions to turn off, so uh, you transgressing. And I'd, I'd like actually uh, Tiamu also to come in. Slight clarity, I'm, and, and this is not me speaking for a country, my perspective is that it 
will always be a business transaction because that's the way our economy works. So to be simplistic or idealistic to say everyone publishes and everyone has access, it will just not be there. It's perhaps the equalization of that process from its current extreme nature to a more equitable nature. And, and that would be the stronger suggestion. Secondly, on paying and the nature's group with gold access to low and middle income countries. There's a, the selection of countries that now pays less, but it doesn't imply at all, and it is not foreseen at all, that it will increase publications from those countries. There's this greyish type of comment in the announcement and the analysis that follows that indicates it might broaden access by these countries to the data, right? So it is a massive process and initiative, I think, that nature has taken and it's applauded. But still, it is so flawed inherently that that is that flawedness that we have to address at a global scale. And it will take some time because publishing for less in a journal doesn't mean greater access uh, to publish in the journal because you can't renege on quality. But of course, it creates now this impression that the content of that will now be made more available to these countries. The final comment would be, and again, at the risk of sounding simplistic, the, the quality aspect must and can never be ignored. That handful of uh, global uh, publications or uh, publication houses really takes up the far majority of these high impact quality, absolutely leading journals. And the large majority of science in the world is directed or influenced specifically by that. So that perhaps is the other consideration of quality. We think that quality will not be influenced by the general access or openness. Initially it will because it costs to produce that type of quality and publish that. Of course, the other side of the question is why must it cost so much, do the same for less, and not make a billion dollars profit every year by house X, you know? So let's just be very clear that we will continue in this competitive economic engagement. Number two, there must be equalization, I think, of access, not absolutely, but it will be informed by the economic environment. And thirdly, let's be very clear that greater access will not really mean greater ability to see the data. It creates just an opportunity to publish for far less in the prestige uh, journals. Tiamo, would you like to add on this? I think it doesn't seem to work. At the, at the is it working? Yeah. Okay. No, thanks very much. I, th I think these are key discussions, colleagues. And I was just chatting here earlier with, with a colleague about the session that we have on Friday. And one of the things that I mentioned in the discussion was, what is the true cost of publishing? And who should pay for what? And I think this is a key one that we need to unpack. And I do agree with, with the comments that Aldo uh, is making. A and whatever dispensation we come up with must really reflect our values. I'm a computer scientist, so I remember in the early 90s when a few individuals developed open source software and released it to the community for free and built the foundations of what we have today in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the compute, and build a community based on altruistic uh, uh, dimensions of sharing what you produce but notwithstanding that you can actually still develop value out of what was created. The information ecosystem that we have today is premised on free information flow. But there are business models that can be had on top of that. So I think really those will be my two comments that let us reflect on the true cost of publishing and let's, let us be transparent about who can pay for what. But let's also recognize that by sharing, 
we are actually opening new frontiers. I like the comment that was made by the last speaker regarding perpetual making of profits. In intellectual property, you have a patent. It's a contract between you and society to say you will own this thing for 20 years, after which the contract elapses, and anybody else can then accrue value out of your patent. It's not perpetual. So I think to comment on what he is saying, eventually we must think about such models. Is it right for us to have journals perpetually accrue profit from old papers, perpetually so? So those are my, two, my three comments, uh, Aldo, on that particular angle. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think, Dr. Balaram, you would like to respond to the question? Uh, I just make a specific comment on this initiative by Springer Nature, which has been just mentioned. Uh, I think this is a model uh, which needs to be examined. I don't think it is a particularly good initiative. It has many inherent problems in it. Isn't going to lead to more publications from the poorer countries, and it isn't going to lead to greater access to those journals. But while I have you here unfrozen, at the expense of offending my colleague uh, uh, at the end of the table who wanted to ask a question, I'll pose one from online. Uh, directed to um, from Anup Kamar Das, who says, I agree to points raised by Professor Balaram. Kindly enlighten us about the proposed fifth science, technology, and innovation policy, STIP, in India, and how open science is planned as per the STIP document. I don't, uh, I must confess that I don't know the details of what is planned. The document was released quite some time ago. And subsequently, I have not seen any specific initiative from the government which addresses how we are going to get greater access uh, to the scientific literature. There was talk at one point of what was called the One Nation, One Subscription uh, View. Uh, there are many of these plans already in operation in other countries. but. Nothing has happened so far. Okay, now we'll go to the end of the this column. There we go. Thank you. I guess uh, it it it's worth being patient <laughs> um, in in these kinds of conversations. Um, my name is Rena Pantaloni. Um, I'm the Director of Copyright Advisory Services at Columbia University, um, so I know uh, of uh, at least one elephant, if not many, um, that, are, that are present. Um, my question is for doc Dr. Gentiman, but uh, I welcome any comments from the panel. Um, and in the work that we're doing at Columbia, looking at issues concerning open science, and certainly in the work that my office is doing, uh, in establishing something called the Open Copyright Education Advisory Network, OCEAN, um, what we're seeing is that it's, there are many issues that are sort of perpetuating the current status quo. And, and one major issue is in informing and educating our scientific community about choice choice, choices that they can make to participate in an open or less open environment. And that has to do with author's rights and the whole issue of authorship. And so my question for Dr. Gentman is, in your Open Science 101 curriculum, are you addressing author's rights and the ability to make choices in what has become an incredibly fractured uh, publishing or distributing environment. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, yes, we're considering that. Uh, it's covered, we're, we have a section on 
copyright. Uh, we have a section on patents and intellectual property. Uh, as I've learned since I've just come to NASA, there are many, many forms that I was supposed to be filling out as a scientist. But I was busy buried in my computer uh, and actually never realized the last 30 years of forms that I miss. Luckily, they haven't come after me for most of them. Uh, and it's this, it's, and that's part of the TOPS initiative is the recognition that there is often this layer of clay between what policymakers are saying or doing or stating as the law of the land. Then it gets, filtered or just not filtered. It gets reflected back upwards and it never percolates downward to the people actually doing science. And this is why uh, a big part of the TOPS initiative is to do this inreach, to do this outreach to the community, to inform them, not so much, to work with them, these are workshops, to really talk about the different choices that they're making as they're doing research. How are they sharing their research? Is it through email or is it through Stack Overflow or GitHub? How can people search for your comments? How openly are you participating on your science teams and how open are those meetings? And what choices do you have when you're publishing? So NASA's new information policy, which goes into effect, it was released in December. It's as of 2023. All scientific uh, results will be open and freely available on publication with no embargo period. And that will include data and software as well. So this addresses one side of that equation, but it sets within the framework of the existing environment. We're also within this Open Science 101 talking about things like Jupyter Notebooks, creating blogs, different ways to open up your research in science. I particularly like the idea of Jupyter Notebooks because you never finish writing a publication and you can continue editing it forever. Um, and the power is, I think that we don't want to estimate, underestimate the power of we versus me. Just like open source software, which has completely revolutionized the commercial and open source software environment and what tools we use to do science, are completely different than they were a decade ago. I think that we need to under, I think that it's important to recognize that with open tools and open publishing, the ability to get DOIs, the ability to do open reviews is going to change how we recognize value in science. Thank you very much. This is really fascinating. We're going to get a quick response from the Secretariat, and then we're going to move to another online question, and then an on-the-floor question, on-the-floor response. Oh, is this in response? Oh, okay. And uh, then we're going to slowly wrap it up because we're all already over time, but you can see the, the such interest generated on in these, these issues that have to be addressed. So we'll go here. Thank you. Just a very, very brief question, actually, follow-up question, because I think this NASA um, Open Science Certificate is something that can be very powerful. And my question was, is it open to all? Can scientists from developing countries participate? And in your new evaluation matrix of what can we evaluate with researchers to promote open science, is collaboration with scientists from developing countries also part of the new evaluation matrix. So that was just a question. So uh, yes, it is open to all. It's freely and openly available. Uh, and we encourage everyone to participate because we want to have this common global language and global understanding to start doing science better together. Uh, and with the open science evaluations, I can only uh, have a voice in what NASA and rec make recommendations of what NASA evaluates. This is where the community, the global community, comes to decide what we value in science and what values align with how we want to do science. So for different countries, for different organizations, when they evaluate, whether it's for tenure, review, and promotion, for hiring practices, what are they asking about and what are they valuing? And I find it valuable. And I find advocating it for it valuable because I see that this is better science. We know that diverse teams, the evidence is overwhelming that diverse teams lead to faster solutions and more long-standing better solutions. So the evidence is there. We just need everyone who does evaluations to start recognizing it. Thank you so much. We'll now go to the floor. And I, 
<laughs> I hate cutting people off. I'm an open moderator, so. <laughs> but we will have to close the session soon, as I'm being told by the organizers. So we'll go, uh, and we also want to have a chance to uh, wrap up. So uh, one more question from the floor, and then we'll go to uh, a minute or two of reflection. Oh. Oh. Okay, oh, was that? <laughs> um, uh, we'll go to the floor here in the front row, and uh, you are eager in the back here to, okay, to respond to all that. So from in the front row to the back row, and then a wrap up. And I realized I don't like closing down such a great discussion. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, I wanted to loop back to a comment that our colleague from OASPA made about asking about diamond open access. And Aldo talked a little bit about we live in a world of capitalism and there may be certain transactional costs. And I'm not sure that needs to be the case. I think this is one of the elephant, it's elephants in the room that we need to discuss. And our proposition is it, if science is so important to solving the world's most pressing problems, should we collectively view science as a public good, and if it is a public good, should we fund the scientific enterprise, including journals, access to journals, contributions to journals, with public funds? And if that were our new norm, could we fund the world's universities and the OA journals uh, that are already doing amazing work to receive those public funds to run diamond open access journals? And so I just want to get that out on the table because I think that's an option in front of us that feels Maybe too far of a stretch, but I'm not sure it is. No response for now. It's, uh, okay. And then one more in the back, and then a wrap up. So, I promise. It's actually, following on from that, um, how about preprints? We haven't talked about preprints at all. Um, preprints are really your affiliation. Uh, Oh, uh, excuse me, Boyana Conforti, I'm at F1000 Research. Um, I, I, I think the issue of preprints and then being able to layer reviews on top of those preprints and have all of those be open and transparent could really sidestep the issue of the journals completely. And if, if there were more mandates, not just for open access, but for preprint publishing, I think that could go a long way. And I'd love to talk to anybody who would be interested in talking more about that. Okay, thank you very much. We're now gonna to move to wrap up. We do have some questions that are online. I'm wondering if we can uh, uh, provide access to, I'm, I'm wrapping it up, uh, provide access uh, the questions to our speakers who can answer them online because it's a Google Doc. Is that a great idea? I mean, is it? <laughs> okay, uh, I'll move. <laughs> I will move first to Dr. Kelly Gentleman. Thank you. I, I'm going to make a comment that I think is an easy win with this crowd, which is I would not be here without my local librarian. And growing up, it was the firehouse on one side and the library on the other. And that's where I went to discover the entire world and to dream beyond the small town that I lived in. And today I think that's true for children around the world, that access, access to knowledge is so critical to involvement in the scientific process as they grow up and become a part of the global community. And I see that this access can we, I'd like to have, have everyone think about this access beyond just the publication, but to think about access to conversations and access to meetings and access to data and software and results. Uh, because this is how science is done and if we only give people the final result, it's very difficult for them to see themselves participating in the process. So access and connectivity to science through the global internet, which is coming very quickly around the world. And I think that open science is going to really benefit from that, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Aldo Strowell. Well, it's a very rich discussion. Firstly, I agree wholeheartedly. It is not that it's not important, but please don't let the efforts of open science in its absolute openness 
be derailed or only overshadowed by an overly critical focus on only the publishing part. Yes, it is important. Yes, it is bothersome. But there's many other dimensions in the multidimensional understanding of open science. We've not discussed once engaged research or science engagement or the role of AI, for instance, etc. And there's many other aspects while this set of challenges are being solved, which one can focus on to advance the openness of open science. And then finally, a light call to policymakers to not underestimate the complexity of this process from an implementation perspective. So we are very far advanced in a settled, broad meta framework for policy, but the implementation is multi-layered and that mustn't be underestimated for us to move forward faster. Thank you so much and we will move to Dr. Balaram. Now I'd just like to make a personal comment. Uh, I've been an advocate of open access in India for a long time, but at the end of my scientific career when I published my last papers, I now look for a journal which is not open access because I cannot anymore afford open access to it. And this is the state to which scientific publishing has come. There was one suggestion which was made, which is enhanced public funding for scientific journals which are produced by scientific societies. That, I think, is a model which might recover some of our journals and make them more accessible. Okay, thank you very much. I think everyone, I will do this on speed. Uh, everybody, it's been a wonderfully rich discussion and I hereby close the session so that there's a slight break before the next one. Mm -hmm.